Well, it's good to see all of you this morning. Look forward to opening God's Word together. I'm excited about it, actually. Um, we're going to start with the word Zion. Zion is a word that is not used very often, uh, except for in really old hymns, and even then, we didn't know what it meant. So, uh, we need to explain the word Zion a little bit, because in today's passage, In Isaiah, when God speaks to his people, he uses the word six times. And as we go through the rest of Isaiah, uh, he's going to use this word over and over and over again, even more. In fact, he uses the word Zion 47 times uh, in the book of Isaiah. So we need to know what it's talking about. It's not simply Jerusalem. So I have a picture on the screen of, actually, this is modern Jerusalem. And it's quite a hilly, steep place, Jerusalem is. Um... Not huge hills, but they call the hills mountains there. Mount Zion is the temple hill in Jerusalem. You can see over here, today there is no temple there. It was torn down by the Romans back in 70 AD. And uh, today there's actually a Muslim mosque on part of the temple mount. This is the temple hill right here. And looking, we're looking straight north, basically, at the Temple Mount there, the Temple Hill in Jerusalem. So let's look at a few verses on the screen that tell us a little bit about how the Bible views Zion. So earlier in Isaiah, it said this about Zion, the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. The Lord of hosts dwells on Mount Zion. So the first thing, Zion is the place where God dwells. Now let's slow down here. There's no place you can go to hide from God's presence. The Bible's really clear that God is everywhere, and yet there seems to be something, especially in the Old Testament, where God has picked out this place to meet his people in a special way. God is everywhere, and yet at Zion, he intended to meet his people in a special way. That's seen very clearly in these verses from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Worshippers go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God. God in Zion. So Zion isn't simply meant to be a a, a poetry for Jerusalem. It's specifically what Jerusalem was intended to be, and that's a meeting place with God. Zion is the place where God meets with his people. Zion is the place where God meets with his people. All right, another verse. This is from the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is looking forward to a day when God's people will be redeemed to Zion, to meeting with God. And this is what it says. The people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together, weeping as they come. And they shall seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion. Not just to Jerusalem, but to the place where they can meet with God, saying, come Let us join ourselves to the Lord. So as I was thinking about those verses earlier um, this week, two words came to mind. Are you ready? Dependent intimacy. Dependent intimacy. That's the whole point of Zion. Now, if you're new joining us or you haven't been here a while, dependent intimacy has been one of the main themes of the book of Isaiah. Now, look at that. The people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together weeping because they've tried to be independent, and yet they recognize they can't, and they're weeping, and they want to be dependent upon the Lord. They shall seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion, saying, come, let us join ourselves, intimacy to the Lord. So God's purpose has always been And always will be for humans to dwell with him in dependent intimacy. God's purpose for Adam and Eve. God's purpose for my sons and daughters. God's purpose for everyone in between, including me. His purpose has always been to dwell with us in dependent intimacy. Now, most of us, I'm waking you up for a moment here. Most of us view God as existing. Most of us, have, you know, but he's sort of across the street. I do my own thing over here. As long as I'm nice, God stays over there. I might call him for emergencies. And yet the whole point, Adam and Eve, it wasn't just they stayed over here and God stayed over there and Adam and Eve were nice. In fact, that was the heart of sin. They wanted to be independent of God. But instead, his whole goal for humans from beginning to end has been to dwell with us dwell with us, not us doing things for God, us doing things with God in dependent intimacy. And Zion, every time you see it, 
Every time you see it, it always has some part of that idea in mind. God doesn't simply want Israel. He wants them to act as Zion in some ways. God doesn't simply want Jerusalem. He wants them to act like Zion, dependent intimacy where you meet with God. In fact, I was surprised this week as I looked through the usages of Zion in the Old Testament. Most of the time when it calls the Israelites the daughters of Zion, usually it's calling to mind what they should be, but they're not living out right now. What they should be, they should be this people who meet with God in dependent intimacy, but they've fallen so far from it. See, the children of Zion reject God. They prefer independence. It's the heart of sin, and all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of dependent intimacy. In fact, all of us have broken hearts that don't truly want complete intimacy with God. We don't really want true and complete dependence upon God. It's the heart of sin. All of us have sinned. And as we read through this Old Testament passage, God has this people in the Old Testament, his people Israel, and they were to be meeting in dependent intimacy with him, but they reject it. So God sends difficulty to the children of Zion to bring them back to dependent intimacy with himself. So the difficulty as we're going through this part of Isaiah is that God has predicted that this foreign nation is going to come. This foreign nation is going to come. And it's the Babylonians, the most powerful, well, they're going to become the most powerful nation on earth. They're going to come and they're going to take his people away. Is that the end? Well, even that, in those circumstances, in those circumstances, God is trying to woo them back. Because Israel's biggest problem is not their circumstances. Our brother, Tom, just a moment ago, gave us a great lead into today's sermon. Our biggest problem is not our circumstances. Our biggest problem is that we don't want to be in dependent intimacy with God. It's sin. And Israel's greatest problem is not the Babylonians, as painful as that's going to be. Their greatest problem is never her circumstances. It is her stubborn refusal to submit to dependent intimacy. My greatest problem, Tice's greatest problem, is not my circumstances. And God has sometimes given me difficult circumstances. And God is going to give me difficult circumstances But it's not my greatest problem. God wants us to take our circumstances to him to bring us to himself or to keep us with himself. Because in our hearts we're stubborn, stubbornly refuse to submit to dependent intimacy. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 51, God wants to speak to a people who is not acting like Zion, but he's going to call them back to a meeting place with him, to walk in dependent intimacy with him. But Israel, at the beginning of this passage, they complain. And actually, if you're going to complain, complaining to the Lord is a good place to start. But then you're going to need to let him be God. You're going to need to let go of something that you think you, well, I don't know. But Israel right here, they're going to complain to the Lord in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 9. And they think that their difficulty is their major problem. But God's going to refocus their attention. He's going to refocus their attitude in some ways like we just read about earlier. If you didn't bring a Bible, we'd love for you to read along. We have black Bibles in the chairs in front of you, and it's page 612 is where we're going to start today as we look at God's word to his people who are not in dependent intimacy, but he's going to woo them back. Okay, so as we look at the very beginning of verse 9, this is Israel out of fellowship, out of relationship, kind of torqued off that they have to go through hard stuff. Verse 9, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. So this is a prayer. Israel's saying, Lord, are you going to help us? Let's talk about the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord is God acting in human history. We're going to see it more and more and more. In fact, next week, next week we're going to see, Lord willing, that the arm of the Lord acts most clearly in human history when he sends his son to be a lamb led before the slaughter. And it's, not, it's the arm of the Lord is moving in human history even through the cross. So the arm of the Lord is God acting in human history. So what are they asking here? Awake, O arm of the Lord! So what are they saying? God, are you asleep? Do you still move in human history? Now let's take a run at it. Verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab into pieces that pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way? I think of the song we just sang. You make the seas a highway for the redeemed to pass over. Remember when you used to do that, God? That's what they're saying. Verse 11. 
And they're, they're longing for this. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing. They shall flee away. Where are you at, Lord? Now, there's a hard thing here at the end of verse 9. Um, it's, it's asking the Lord to come and cut Rahab into pieces. That's not talking about the prostitute in the Joshua story. This is actually language that's talking about... Um, well, it's talking about a big sea monster, and as we find out, it's, it's picturing image as a big sea, uh, Egypt, excuse me, as a big sea monster. So big, and remember, Egypt was for much of this time a superpower that no one could conquer, except the Lord. Except the Lord. Who can conquer this huge sea monster that is Egypt? Well, the Lord can. It was you, Lord, who cut Rahab into pieces. We see this earlier, calls Egypt uh, Rahab back in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Who else can pierce this dragon? Verse 10, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? Again, when they, God led them out of Egypt, he led them in the wild thing. He led them to a place where they were trapped. Let that sink in for a minute. God led them to a place where they were trapped, where the only hope they had was to turn to him. And then he delivered them. But they're like, God, we remember when you used to do cool stuff, but why don't you do cool stuff anymore? God, remember when you used to do amazing and powerful stuff? Where are you now? Some of you are asking that question today. In fact, I think the Lord wants you to write something down if you're taking notes of the thing the Lord is calling you to trust him with. Lord, where are you today? Your circumstances. You don't completely ignore your circumstances. You take your circumstances to God. You ask for daily bread. We're at, commanded to pray for daily bread in our circumstances so that his kingdom come and his will will be done. Now, in our church, by God's grace, we have faithfully preached the word of God for a long time. We believe that the events in the Bible actually happened. But there's sometimes a danger for us who hold God's word high, and that is that it becomes good old days preaching. Well, remember in the good old days when God used to do cool stuff, but now he's, he's well, I guess it's just kind of us, up to us and maybe the Republican Party to save the world. Remember when God used to do cool? Too bad he doesn't do cool stuff anymore. Too bad God doesn't work to redeem his people and fight for the glory of his name anymore. Oh, woe is me. Well, I think I'm going to go watch some television. Where are you, Lord? Are you going to act in history? And he still does act in history. If he doesn't, again, I've said this a lot in the book of Isaiah. We need to close up our doors. If God's asleep, if he's far away, if he doesn't act in human history anymore, we are wasting our time. And yet he fights for the glory of his name. And they're asking, Lord, when will you restore dependent intimacy in Zion? And the Lord speaks. Verse 12, the Lord answers them, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that are afraid of man who dies? of the son of man who is made like grass. And you've forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy. Where is the wrath of the oppressor, the Lord says. He says, you're afraid. Why are they afraid? Now think about this just a moment. Are their circumstances frightening? Yes, they are. But God is telling them, take your eyes off your circumstances. Take your circumstances to me. I'm the one who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and I'm still active, by the way. Still moving to fight for the glory of my name and for the good of my people. So, what about you? Are you going to keep your eyes on your problems? Now, I don't want to minimize your problems because they're real, but God wants to meet you in them. I don't want to minimize the pain of your problems because it's real and Jesus wants to walk with you in that pain. Or are you going to keep your eyes on the powerful God, the one who stretched out the heavens, the one who laid the foundations of the earth and he's still active today? Take it to him. He wants to speak. Where your eyes are in some ways are going to determine your future. Humans are good meditators, but we often meditate on the wrong things instead of meditating on our powerful God and his plans and his purposes. We want him to baptize our plans and our purposes. So we get all upset when our circumstances get all bad. But he wants to woo us even through those. Verse 14, he who is bowed down shall speedily be released. 
He shall not die and go down to the pit. Neither shall his bread be lacking. I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Now, this is talking about how powerful God is that he releases people who are oppressed, verse uh, 14, and he's the God who can stir up the sea if he wants to. He's also the God who can cut the sea in half if he wants to, like we just read about in Exodus earlier, right? When they made reference to the Exodus. He's the one who can stir up nations, Cyrus, if he wants to. He's the one who can put down nations if he wants to. Our powerful God is in the business of redeeming his people back into dependent intimacy. He's the one who can stir up the oceans. Now listen to me, some of you are believing a lie that you're the first person in human history who has a circumstance too big for the living God. He controls the oceans! Let that sink in for a moment. I need to be screaming at myself. He controls the oceans. He laid out the heavens. He's still active in history. And yet I believe, okay, I, I'm guilty too, which I'm just preaching to myself. I, I believe a lie that I'm the first person in human history with circumstances too big for God. It's a lie. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the gift of the guilt within, upward I look, upward I look, and I see him there who made an end to all my sin. And that points us directly to verse 16, actually. Now, God says, I have put my words in your mouth. There's a subject change here. He's not talking to Israel anymore. I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundations of the earth and saying to Zion, you are my people. We know it can't be Israel because Israel doesn't say it to itself. You're my people. Now, this language we saw earlier in the beginning of verse 16, back in 49.2, it's Jesus, the Messiah, the Messiah's servant that we're learning about in Isaiah. God's deliverance will ultimately come not from our own effort, not from a political party, not from even being nice to your neighbor, but from a servant Messiah. God's deliverance is going to come from the servant Messiah. It's said back in 49, uh, 2, specifically God speaks to his servant. He says, I will put my words in your mouth and I will hide you in my hand. And that's what it's talking about right here. Who's going to bring deliverance? Jesus, the servant Messiah. Jesus is going to gather God's people together into the dependent intimacy of Zion. Notice the language at the end of verse 16. Jesus says to Zion, you're my people. This isn't just like us doing things for God who's far away. He's Emmanuel who draws near to us. He walks with us in intimacy. You're my people. In fact, he wants to say to you, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're my son. Now, you have to take your sin to him. You, you give it to him in faith and he offers to pay for it. But then he calls you his son, his, his daughter. You're my people. Now, the subject changes again in verse 17. And in verses 17 through 23, Jerusalem is pictured as a drunk old lady, a drunk old woman, instead of a beautiful bride, Zion. So throughout Isaiah and many, Isaiah and many of the uh, scriptures in the Old Testament, Zion is pictured as a beautiful bride. That's what God's people are supposed to be like, ready for the groom, a beautiful bride. And yet, in reality, we're more like a drunk old woman. <laughs> And God's people here are pictured as a drunk old woman instead of a beautiful bride, Zion. Verse 17, God speaks to Jerusalem. Wake yourself. Wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. Notice he didn't call him Zion. Wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering, there is none to guide Jerusalem among all the sons she has borne. There is none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. So they're suffering. Israel is suffering under the hand of the Lord suffering from the hand of God because of her sin. She loved other things more than God. 
Some ways she's committed, no, not in some ways, completely. She's committed adultery against the living God. Is there any forgiveness and hope for her? She loves something else besides her groom. Guess what that is? It's adultery, right? So Israel's suffering and God has poured out the cup of his wrath when they go through this Babylonian exile. He's pouring out and they're lying drunk on the street. They can't help it. They're, they've made all these bad choices and now they're under God's discipline. And God is challenging Israel here to wake herself from her drunken stupor. Wake up, Jerusalem. Wake up. She can't. In fact, the language is different. Earlier, they asked God to awake. And later on in, verse, in 52 verse 1, God says, awake. But this language is different. The idea is, come on, Jerusalem, get up from your staggering. Because she can't. That's the point. She needs a savior. Maybe her sons will save her. No, nope. no. Nope. Look at verse uh, 18. There's none to guide her among all the sons that she's born. Maybe her priests, the sons, or, you know, maybe some other lover can come and save her. There's none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. Verse 20. Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. They're full of the wrath of the Lord. They're drunk too from God's wrath and the rebuke of your God. See, Israel cannot save herself from God's wrath. Nor can her sons, nor can anything else or anyone else save her. There's a common lie uh, in our culture that you have to clean yourself up to come to the living God. But that's ridiculous. She's lying, okay, I'm just gonna go with the image here. She's lying in the street, she's an old woman, and she's drunk, covered in vomit. She can't clean herself up. She needs a savior. She needs a savior. Is God still gonna love this drunk, ugly old woman? Interesting question, important question. Or is God gonna wait for her to clean herself up? Will God show grace to this adulterous old woman? Verse 21. Therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord your God. I'm sorry, the Lord. Your Lord, the Lord. Your God who pleads the cause of his people. Notice he wants to plead her cause. Behold, I have taken from your hand this cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath. You shall drink no more. He's, all, he's offering her forgiveness. Will she receive it? And I will put it into the hands of your tormentors who have said to you, bow down that we might pass over you, that, have made, uh, that you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. All right. So God is offering to forgive Israel. God redeems his people back to dependent intimacy. Will she receive it? She can't clean up her own mess. She can cry out to the Lord and be saved, but that's her only hope. The way to be made right with God is to to put your faith in Jesus, to cry out to him, you can't save yourself. Israel can't save herself. Nothing's gonna save her except for the Lord. Will she turn to him? God redeems his people back to dependent intimacy. Will we receive it? Now, God also promises here in his grace that he's gonna take this cup of wrath and, and the oppressors of Israel are gonna pay for their sins. God called Babylon. God called Babylon to... Um, to conquer Israel, but it wasn't because Babylon's gods were more powerful. He was wooing his people back, but Babylon, even in that, is gonna have to pay for her sins, so therefore Israel doesn't have to wor worry about taking revenge. All right, 52 and verse one. Remember the imagery of a woman, a drunk old woman here. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Notice earlier he called her Jerusalem, but here, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Those are some of the greatest Jewish ideas for sin. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. See, God is restoring the children of Zion to dependent intimacies. What he wants to do with you what he wants to do with me. Okay, now we've been using this women imagery. And earlier, um, earlier, you know, what chapter is it? I think it's chapter 47 where God, uh, he talks to Babylon, this wicked empire. And Babylon is, is pictured as a woman in chapter 47, a very proud woman, a very beautiful woman, a very powerful woman. 
And God says to Babylon, turn to me or I'm going to put you in the dust. And so that's a direct, if you think about it, here we have drunken old Israel laying in the dust and we have proud Babylon on her throne and God says, well, things are going to be reversed. See, Zion is compared with Babylon. In Isaiah 47, Babylon is removed from her throne because of her arrogance. He says it explicitly. Get down off your throne and go get in the dust, Babylon. You're trusting in yourself. You're trusting in your own strength. You're following your own ways. And yet, here is drunken, drunken Israel, ugly and haggard and old, and yet God wants to lift her up. God wants to lift her up and restore her to himself, put beautiful clothes on her. And if Israel will surrender to the Lord, God will make her beautiful. If Israel will, return, will surrender to the Lord, God will make her beautiful and he will place her on a throne. So Babylon taken off of the throne and yet he's offering Jerusalem, offering Zion if they'll turn to him to be put upon a throne. Okay, let's pause here. Just bear with me for a, a bit of poetry here. I would argue that all of us naturally uh, tend to find ourselves either in the Babylon camp where, ah, you know, uh, God, I don't need God that much. I'm not as bad as those morons over there. You know, I haven't sinned that badly, okay? And God's saying, you need to get off your throne. You need to surrender to me. And then some of you, some of you believe the lie that you're like, you say, well, I'm like Jerusalem and God could never love me. And this blasts a hole in that as well. Satan wants you to believe that you don't need God, Babylon. Or Satan wants you to believe that you're, you're not redeemable, Jerusalem. And yet he's speaking to both of you. He's speaking to all of us. We all are desperately needy for grace, desperately needy. So he calls us to surrender in faith, surrender in faith to him. Well, let's keep going. Verse three, for thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now, therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here am I. Now, a couple chapters ago, uh, in chapter 50, God said, I didn't sell you because I owed anyone money. I didn't sell you because I owed any God's money. That's what he's talking about right here. You were, you were sold to Babylon, if you want to use that language. You were given to Babylon for nothing. I don't owe them. God never sold ownership of Israel to another uh, nation. He is not forced to repay anyone. He's doing this sheerly out of his grace. And he's going to redeem his people out of his grace. He doesn't owe his people anything. He doesn't owe Babylon anything. He's going to redeem them sheerly out of his grace. Now look at the end of verse 5. Um, it says that their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. So Babylon's going to come in and they're going to say, the reason you're losing is because Yahweh is weak. Marduk, he is strong. So they're, they're saying, well, your Lord, his name, not that powerful, but God is not going to stand for it. He's going to fight for it. Look at verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. God's going to fight for the glory of his name. He's going to fight for the glory of his name. So God redeems people so that they will know his name. Now, this word know here is referring to dependent intimacy. Know. It's the same word that's used in Hebrew for Adam knowing his wife. Adam didn't simply know about his wife. He experienced intimacy, beautiful, blessed intimacy with his wife. God doesn't want you to simply know about his name. God doesn't want you to simply ask, answer uh, several questions on a quiz about him. He wants you to experience beautiful, dependent intimacy with him. And my people will know my name. He's promising right here. Okay, one last image. One last image in this as found in verse 7. So, Here's a picture of what Zion in many ways is like spiritually apart from God, a broken down city, broken down into rubble. Will God's people ever experience Zion again? He pictures them as like huddled up soldiers standing on the wall here in the next few verses. They're standing on the wall and we'll just imagine it's, you know, 
December in Nebraska, and it's cold, and they're, you know, they're, it's windy. Of course it's windy, right? And um, so they're looking out, and they don't have cell phones, by the way. How are they supposed to know who won the victory? Well, someone's going to come. A messenger's going to come and tell them who won the victory. So they're all looking out, and they've been looking for days. Wonder who won the victory. Poor old us. Hey, what's Facebook say? All right. Anyway, that's not really what they were doing. That's what we do. But anyway, they're looking out. Who won the victory? Will God's people ever experience Zion again? Verse 7. Oh, look! Someone's there! Verse 7! How beautiful! How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Maybe this guy's got good news. He's running. Who is it? I think it's Jones. Yes, it is. Jo- I don't know who it is. Jonah Chaim. I just made that up. There we go. We've got an English... Okay, Jewish, okay, whatever. All right, I'm sorry. I don't know who this schmo is who's coming over the hills, but it, wait, he's, I wonder if it's good news or bad news, but ah, oh, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes, I don't like that word, announces is a better word, who announces peace, who brings good news. He's dancing. He's waving his arms. He's announcing salvation. What's he saying? He's saying something. Listen, he says to Zion, your God reigns. What? Now look at the verse 8. The voice of your watchman. They're all seeing the dude coming over. Jones a Chaim, all right? The voice of your watchman. They let, you guys are slow today. You really are. I didn't do that in the early service, by the way. The voice of your watchman. They lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. Eye to eye. They're passing along the news. They see the return of the Lord to not just Jerusalem, Zion. Oh, I love this. How blessed and beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. Romans 10 points this to Jesus, all right? A message of hope. Our God is king. Present tense, November 8th, 2020. Present tense. The Hebrew literally says, our God kings. That doesn't make good English sense, right? Our God kings. He's reigning as king right now. No one's taken his throne The church in China has been reminding of this for 70, 80 years. They don't like their government. They like it even less than you do. And yet the church, when they keep their eyes on Jesus, has flourished. They've made disciples secretly at night and studied God's word secretly at night. And God's name is being made famous. Our God's king. It doesn't matter what political party is in charge. Our God is king. May we be the messengers of good news like this, running over the mountains and proclaiming it to our neighbors and to our family. Now, Jesus allows people to experience dependent intimacy, spiritual Zion now. And he will one day return to set up physical Zion on earth. Verse 8 is very clear. Eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. We're going to find out later. And it's, as I was looking at Isaiah 65 and 66, it's really interesting how it uses the Zion language. When Jesus comes back, he's going to establish Zion. And yet, this is hard, but today, even now, God has laid a precious cornerstone in Zion. So we want to experience parts of Zion spiritually. Even now, his son Jesus, we can experience and taste his goodness spiritually even now, even in the midst of difficulty. But one day, literally, the fairy tale, it's not a fairy tale, it's going to come true. Our king is going to come back and he's going to fix everything that's broken. Oh, we long for that day. And by the way, when everything's fixed, if God gives you heaven without him there, it's worthless. Worthless. It's not about streets of gold. It's not about no suffering. It's about seeing God face to face. That's who we need. That's who we long for. Dependent intimacy. He's going to come and he's going to set it up on earth. We long for you, Lord Jesus. All right, verse 9. Here, verse 9 is reasons for you to take courage. I don't know what you're struggling with. Write down that struggle, that circumstance that God is having you walk through. Look to him, verse 9. Break forth together into singing your waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm. He's acted in history, in other words. Before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Holy arm. God God acts in history. God redeems his people back to dependent intimacy, and he's going to make his salvation known to the ends of the earth. Now, there's a great and deep mystery 
that we're going to be looking into next week in that the arm of the Lord is first revealed. Well, go to look at 53 in verse 1. Go down to 53 in verse 1. Who has believed what they heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then it's about to talk about the suffering of the servant. The suffering. Who's going to be despised and rejected and buried in a grave with rebels and transgressors. And yet even in that, God is going to redeem that and he's going to show that he acts in human history. It's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. Shows God's arm that he enters into suffering and he redeems it. He wants to do that for you. Our job is to, to surrender to it. To surrender to it. Now verse 11. Depart. Depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves. You who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go out in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel, he will be your rear guard. So they're going to have to undergo Babylon, and we all undergo things in which God calls us out of it. The Apostle Paul uses this language to talk about every Christian's experience of having to flee the sin that was so easily entangles us. Whenever God redeems his people, he calls them out of their sin adultery. And we all have sin adultery. Sin adultery. But God calls us out of it. And he's saying right here, uh, flee from Babylon and all the things that ensnared you. For me, it's wanting a comfortable life. I'd rather be in the boat. I don't want to get out of the boat and follow Jesus. That's sin adultery. And yet he calls us to flee from it. But looking, uh, leaving our old ways, completely surrendering to Christ, that's terrifying. It's terrifying if not for verse 12. Look at verse 12. You shall not go out in haste. You shall not go in flight. For the Lord will go before you. So if you give up your ways for the Lord's ways, is it worth it? He's going to go before you. He says he's going to go before you. But not only that, look at the very end. The God of Israel will also be your rear guard. He goes before you when you follow his ways. He goes behind you when you follow his ways. Some of you, he's calling you to surrender your ways to him today and follow his ways. He's going to go before you and behind you. He surrounds his people. He promises to go before us. He promises to go behind us. He still acts in history for the glory of his name. And when you live for your own glory or your own comfort, you're fighting against the glory of his name, but he wants to redeem you back. Let's not be stubborn. Let's surrender to him. Let's surrender to him. So one of the themes today, if you haven't picked it out yet, is going to be driven home in just a moment. And that is we've got to take our eyes off of our circumstances and put them on our holy God. Take our eyes off of our circumstances and remember how powerful he is and that he's still moving. And we're going to sing a beautiful song that reminds us all to put our lives in his hands and to look to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. Lord God, I want to, uh, we confess that we are ugly, old, drunk in Jerusalem apart from you and we can't save ourselves. And we thank you for your grace that you come and you woo us and you call us to get up out of the dust and you want to clothe us with beautiful clothing. And you, you find us valuable despite our sin. So please help us to respond to that with joy and help us to live with joy and live differently as we follow your paths. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As Tess just said, to wrap up this whole message of us being redeemed, the appropriate response is to sing the words of this song.